my name is Andy Schmidt Andrus, and I'm the director at Kaufman Museum in North Newton, Kansas. If you're viewing this video between the dates May 2nd and May 16, 2021, it means you participated in FOSBOX, a spring fundraiser. We appreciate your support and hope you enjoyed the meal. I'd like to introduce Glenn Ettinger, who will be doing a program, and that program is called Of Sweebach and FOSPA. Glenn has paid, played many different roles at Kaufman Museum. In the 1970s, he assisted then director Steve Friesen in acquisitions. Later, he served on the board of directors and as president. Around that same time, he also curated the exhibit Threshing Stone, Threshing Stone Artifact or Icon. That gave us just a glimpse into Glenn's interest in Mennonite ethnic history. Today he shares that interest through a blog on Facebook called Mennonite Farmer. I'd encourage you to look up the Facebook posts and subscribe. There are many interesting posts that Glenn's posted on that Mennonite Farmer blog on Facebook. In the presentation, presentation today, Glenn will be sharing information of Sweebach and FOSPA. Welcome, Glenn. Well, here I am again, speaking about food. I'm not an expert, I'm not a cook, not a baker, but I do like food and food traditions. But that, does that qualify me to talk about this? I enjoy the research, pictures, and stories, and then retelling them in a way that is hopefully interesting, informative, and nostalgic. I grew up in central Kansas on a wheat farm. My family was a typical low German Russian Mennonite family. Church and family were central to life, with food traditions being a part of that experience. Like many German, low German Mennonite families, Sweebach and Fospa were a regular part of my life. I suspect many of you too experienced that. And if you have no idea of what Sweebach are or what Fospa is, I hope you might learn a bit, but mostly just be entertained at this Coffin Museum Spring Gala event. Many of us no longer live on small community, Mennonite communities, yet some of these traditions still continue in our families, as they have for hundreds of years. We still eat Sweebach and other traditional foods when we can, whether they are made by our grandma or bought at a store. Do you have Fospa memories? Fospa and Sweebach are very much centered in the Low German Prussian Russian Mennonite tradition. I'll speak about these traditions based on my personal experiences, along with comments from ed individuals who experience these traditions in many locations. The Plumoosta Pie Cookbook defines Fospa as one of those Low German words for which there is no direct English translation. Fospa meant a light lunch at about 4 p.m. on workdays. Fospa also meant gathering of families and friends, usually about 4 p.m. on Sunday for a light meal and fellowship, with the emphasis on fellowship. The meal always included sweet coffee, and might include cheese, cold cuts, and jelly. Many of us grew up with this tradition and know all about it. We will each have similar experiences, yet have very different memories of FOSPA. If these are not a part of your experience, I hope you'll get a sense of the joy experienced in these traditions. I've already given you the traditional description of FOSPA, but FOSPA can mean a variety of things. Some associate FOSPA only as a Sunday afternoon event with visitors. Some associate it with a light meal brought to the field in a mid-afternoon. Yet others may know FOSPA as a wedding or funeral meal. To some, FOSPA only means what you eat, not what day of the week you eat or what time of day you eat. The entomology of the word FOSPA, according to the Global Anabaptist Mennonite Encyclopedia, says, FOSPA is a Low German Plautdeutsch word. In High German, the word is Vesper. FOSPA is used in cultures of Mennonites and their descendants who settled in Eastern Europe and in the Russian Empire. The German Vesper is a word from a classical Latin meaning evening. However, Vesper in contemporary German uh, can also mean break or brunch. To Mennonite families, FOSPA emphasizes the fellowship of family and friends, or the work, workday FOSPA brought to a stop, rest, and visit. My wife Karen gave me her interpretation of FOSPA. I associate FOSPA with the Sabbath. 
So Saturday evening fasba was the equivalent of the Jewish Friday evening meal, and Sunday the ending meal of the Sabbath. They are a kind of bookends. The crowdsourced, unabashed, and crude Urban Dictionary even has this definition. Fasba is a low German Plattdeutsch word is still used by Mennonites to refer to the light lunch with friends and family. The meal will almost always be composed of buns or the traditional Schwebach, which are basically rich buns that kind of look like boobs, and in a variety of cheeses, cold cuts, pickles, and jams. Everything is cold because there isn't time to prepare a hot meal. The kids will stuff their faces and pockets with foods, then run outside to play games, while the adults will stand around the table and talk about the sermon for a minute before conversation devolves into joking stories about, about Grandpa in the old days. In my family, it was typical to have phosphate brought to the field by my mother, just for Dad or during harvest for the whole family, and sometimes even with added relatives. This photo is in the Lawrence newspaper showing my mom bringing phosphate to the field. She would bring a blanket and spread it out in the shade of the truck and serve food from the back of the pickup. Food, again, was simple and light typically consisting of swebok, bologna, ham, or cold sausage, and wedges of Colby cheese, and maybe Enyolita Gertje, and with a drink of coffee or sweet iced tea and dessert of schnitzia and plouts. Bertha, Mrs. Herb Schrader, wrote of her childhood years ago in From Plumamost Pie cookbook. We always ate phosphate in the field, trying to find some shade close to the wagon in which we were riding to the field. Of course, by then, the coffee was lukewarm, but to us, hot and thirsty, it was delicious. The menu included fresh sweebok, sugar cubes, cake, and two kettles of hot coffee, Red Wolf brand, and of which we were, were served in the field. After phosphate, we took the burlap-wrapped water, wrapped water jugs to refill with fresh water and soaked the burlap again to keep the jugs cool. The jugs were sent to the field with the next wheat wagons. Then it was time to do the evening chores. Sunday afternoon fossa was most common on our farm. Our farm was on Dutch Avenue between Bueller and Heston. We were a great Sunday afternoon destination for the city uncles and aunts and cousins to get out to the farm for some fresh air and fospa. We even had a secret code with my uncle Elmer Ediger when they drove by on Sunday afternoon headed to Bueller. If they honked one long and two shorts, that meant they would stop by on their way back to Newton later to visit and pick up some eggs. My cousin Dave Ediger recalls, What I remember is Sunday afternoon was a gathering point at people's houses. It's like our aunts, and aunts anticipated company coming. There was always food. People would step, stop by unannounced, and they would be welcomed in. It would be kind of assumed that phosphate would be served on Sunday afternoon. There were these many reunions. The Edigers got together at Grandma's house, and just a half a block away the Martins were getting together, and then down the street the Schmitz, and then the other directions the Siemens got together. So, phosphate gatherings were not at all unusual in the Bueller area. I mean, the women really worked hard. Guys weren't in the kitchen at all. They were lollygagging in the living room or outside. A few of the uncles would be smoking out in the backyard. It was very typical to have some type of sweet, sweet included at the end, a type of tart which we called plouts, sandhill plum plouts and apricot plouts. The Mennonites brought their way of life with them to southern Manitoba when they left their farms and villages in Russia. The family remained the centerpiece of each custom and tradition. It was a culture of church, family, friends, and hard work and play. Parents spent Sunday afternoons entertaining unannounced guests. We were always welcome. If no one came to visit on a Sunday afternoon, their parents packed up their young children and we went out to visit someone else. Every day except Sunday was a work day. Saturdays were especially busy in preparation for Sundays. The women baked large pans of swebok, loaves of bread, and a big pan of cake to be served on Sunday, when they might have, have guests come over for phospha. On Sundays, the women only needed to set the table with food and they already that they had already prepared for the day the day before. Ron Peters recalled, to me Fosma is the more more of a Sunday afternoon thing. We would go to church, then mom and dad would take a nap, and then later we would call somebody. Hey, can we come over to visit? My brother and I would always ask if we could go over to someone who had kids so we could play. Then maybe around four o'clock the women would go to get some sweebok and cheese, borscht and jelly out. You know, it was plain so to simplify Sunday work. 
When the women would start getting the food together, the men would go out to the barn to take care of other needs behind the barn. But in the meantime, we kids would be playing. I won't say what we did once, but it involved a BB gun. We got caught, and that did not go over very well. Al Peters recalls, well, Grandma had six sons, and when they grew up, they would bring their families on Sunday's afternoons. They would all be there. Grandma put the Swebach and maybe some bologna and jam on the table already at 3 o'clock so that, hey, get them fed and get them out of there so you can go home and do the chores. But when I was young, we would go to our aunts and uncles or our neighbors, and they would visit and have FOSPA on a Sunday afternoon. I remember one time we had neighbors who had just gotten married. They were English. My parents went over there on a Sunday afternoon without any warning. And they were like, what do you want? And folks said, well, we're here to come to see you. But there was no FOSPA. But at least they had a good visit. Ron continued, on the farm we would be working in the field, out with a tractor, plowing or whatever. Mom would always bring FOSPA to the field. One of the unique things was my grandpa's Peters. He just happened to always show up at about time to have FOSPA. Sometimes when we shelled corn, which was really heavy work, they would bring FOSPA and include plouts. Those were special things for us kids. They would, we would just eat and eat because you, weren't, you were working hard shelling corn and we were always hungry. As we've heard from all these stories, the traditions and foods of FOSPA were very similar. No matter where you grew up, from Bueller to Gossel or Manitoba to Texas, the Low German Mennonite tradition survived. Most people recall jam for the bread. Jam in the early days was always homemade, from fruit of the farm. Jam was the simplest thing to serve with the Swebach. The, con the common menu, in addition to Swebach, was some type of protein with cheese and meat. In our tradition, the cheese was usually round Colby cheese cut into wedges. I'm sure other communities had other cheeses too. Our fleisch or vorst could be bologna, schinkefleisch, which is ham, cold sausage, or leftover meat from a roast. Most memories include coffee for the adults, and even in the heat of the summer. I remember how could my dad drink hot, horrible tasting coffee when it was so hot in the field. My mom, however, always had very sweet tea for everyone else. Other sides at our house could include sweet pickles, Enulita Gertje pickles, or curlers and watermelon. Enulita is a summer treat and was always welcome on our farm. Quick and simple to make with boiling water, pickling salt and vinegar with dill, grape, or cherry leaves. They were crisp, refreshing, and tasty, also known as refrigerator pickles by the English. But often there was a sweet item like plouch, schnetje, or cake for a delightful finish. Plouts is a type of dessert or fruit pizza. Mom used Swebach dough or maybe bread dough for the crust, which she patted out in the cookie sheet. She used an available seasonal fruit from the farm. People used whatever they had. After baking, she drizzled icing over it. Plouts can vary from resembling a pie crust to more like a biscuit or shortcake base. Schnetje is also part of my tradition. My mother would make them as a rolled up snack made from pie dough that was covered with cinnamon and sugar. Another variation of schnetje is similar to baking powder biscuits, but lighter, richer in butter and cream. This very rich finger biscuit was part of an Old West Prussian custom. This food goes back to the time when men and women worked hard and physically, and they burned a lot of calories, and they needed a carb-based replenishing snack. Now let's focus on Swebach. Without a doubt, Swebach, or Tabach in Low German, is the iconic sweet and buttery two-tiered roll made by Mennonites for hundreds of years. Swebach are similar to bread rolls, but are richer, traditionally made using lard, but now with butter or shortening or canola oil, a bit saltier and not quite so firm as bread dough. It's still debated whether they should be made with eggs or not. Norma Jost Vos says the Swebach, unique in shape, are formed by placing one bun on top of another. One ball of dough slightly flattened forms the bottom. A second piece, a little smaller, is pinched off and pressed onto the bottom one so that it won't topple off while baking. Swebach can trace its origins to Holland. Historian Cornelius Kron believes Swebach may be the only item among other varied traditional foods that date back to the Reformation, or time of Men of Simons. Mennonite immigrants from the Netherlands who settled in Prussia 
continued this practice when they later brought them to the Ukrainian colonies. S. L. Clausen says, but Swebach is a bread worth fighting for. The bread in question belongs to that tiny slice of the mineral world that began in Friesland in 1700s and then spanned out through northern Europe, steering clear of Switzerland and the Americas until at least the 19th century. I'm going to just start by saying that all true Swebach are made with butter. We know this because our grandmothers told us not to put butter on the Swebach because there's butter in it, not that we listened. A soft little double bun with a cute little dimple on top, it's dainty wheat carbohydrate ranging from 2 to 4 inches in diameter and coming to about 2 to 3 inches in height. The two halves stick together like they are newly in love, remaining nestled to each other until gently pried apart, which we do with our thumb and index finger for the purpose of sharing the tiny bread with another, or simply to reveal and plop a dollop of jam in the bottom's little indent. Norma Jo Thos gives a historical lesson. Our grandmothers break Swebach in the grass burner oven in the outdoor kitchen of her Kansas farm. It was, the, it was the task of her boys to fill the oven with straw and tend to it until the bricks were filled with heat. Her long black pans, four feet long and eight inches wide, were filled many times with dozens of Swebach bones for the large family. My uncle still insists no other oven, no matter how modern or convenient, can produce such wonderful tasting Swebach. The perfect Swebach question will raise a debate on what the right answer is. Are they generally small or are they big? With just a little tiny top? Is the top bun centered over the bottom bun or is it just barely hanging on the edge? Does it have a dimple on top or does it not? Are they dark and crisp or are they lightly tanned and very soft? How do you eat a Swebach? Do you pull it apart or eat it whole? Do you eat the top first or the bottom first? Do you put a dollop of jelly in the bottom or do you balance gloms onto the top sphere? Or do you smash a hunk of meat and cheese between the two and eat it like a sandwich? Do you embellish the taste with mustard, horseradish, or mayonnaise? Do you ever add additional butter to the Swebach? If so, is it cold and hard and laying on the top? Or do you hope it melts into the bread when it's steaming hot just out of the oven? I'll remember Swebach. It's an amazing how different Swebach can vary from one household to another. I had an aunt who would make them small and dark, and others who would make them soft when they were barely done. My favorite ones were those that were a little black on the bottom and toasted on the top. I always thought they had a little bit more flavor. For me it was always jam, but if we had meat it was like a sandwich. Just stick a piece of bologna in there, or if you had leftover beef or pork, just put it in the Swebach. I liked the top better. It was usually browner, but if the bottom was baked a little dark, I like that too. When I think of prolific Swebach bakers, I think of Eileen Schmidt and Lori Workentine Schrag. While I read their interviews, I'll be showing photos of the steps to making Swebach made by Lori Schrag. But as you know, there's not just one recipe or one method to making them. Starting with Eileen. I didn't start making Swebach until later in life. I didn't grow up making them in Idaho. I got my first recipe from the Bethel College Women's Association. I thought that sounds a little different, so I'll try that. And when my luck, that's when my luck began. I asked, who do you make them for? Well, I always make them for the family and give them some to take home when they leave. I've always baked them for Bethel College Women's Association, always for Coffee Museum when they had a food sale, and for Kidron and Bethel when they had a sale, and of course for church. There's no way you'd know how many you've made, but probably in the thousands. Oh, definitely in the thousands. I did 60 just this week. What things do you do that make the perfect Swebach? Well, I put a little bit of dried mashed potatoes in the batter. The reason for that is I think it helps them stay longer in the freezer. How do you make them? Well, you put the flour in until it feels right. Then you knead and knead and knead. Then you let it rise and then you shape them. And that's it and then you bake them. I said, you sure make it sound easy. Do you use butter? Actually, I use canola oil. It was the gosso recipe that used butter all the time. How do you make the top stay in place? I make a dent in the bottom one and put the top one on. I remember my Idaho mother made them once in a while, but it wasn't like every Saturday, like you had to do here in Gossel. 
I like to bake them on a day when I have time and put them in the freezer. But they did not have freezers in the old days. Now Lori Schrock. Grandma made them every Saturday. She's my dad's mom, the working teen grandma. She grew up in Mead, and when she got married, they moved to Bueller until 1939 when my dad was 10 years old when they moved to Reedley. Grandma was little and strong. She was about five foot tall and 90 pounds. She would set, set the bowl on a step stool so she could knead it. She practically climbed in and she put a lot of muscle into it as she worked the dough. And then they were always perfect. Everything Grandma made was perfection. How did you learn to make Sweebach? Well, I went to Grandma's house when I was in college. I spent the day with her. I wanted to learn from her how to make Sweebach. I tried writing down the recipe as we were making them, but her cup she used was a little old ceramic cup with a broken handle, and she would just dip that in the flour and she knew just how many to use. My brother later measured that cup and it was only about two-thirds of a cup, and he figured out how many cups she was actually using. I asked, there's no way you would know how many you've made. I know I've made lots of Sweebach, but I have no idea how many I've made. Who have you made them for? I make them mostly for family, also for church things, always for Bethel Fall Fest and for the women's Christmas bake sale, always for MCC sale, and last year for Camp Minisco fundraiser. I made 12 dozen. So yeah, I've made a lot of Sweebach. Well, I could not talk about everything or of everyone's experience. I know I didn't even mention Russia Tveibach or many other things I could have talked about, but I just tried to share some stories. When my ancestors came to Kansas, they brought their low German language, turkey red wheat, the recipe for this addictive roll called Sweebach, which now has iconic stature. Mennonites also brought the Frosper tradition. It's not only served because people are hungry or thirsty, but also as a show of hospitality. FOSPA offers a form of congenial visiting, laughter, and camaraderie between family, friends, and neighbors. Sweebach and FOSPA are our traditions. They were certainly a part of mine, and maybe yours too. Each family will have their variations on how FOSPA is experienced or how Sweebach should be made. But however your family does it, that's the right way. So try to continue the FOSPA traditions with your friends and family, or maybe make some Sweebach and enjoy new memories. Nayo. So let's enjoy a little. So here's the Fospa.